Hello, and welcome to another episode of Lost in Criterion. Today, I'll be your host, John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and... Hi, I'm Adam Glass. Okay, today we will be talking, we will be discussing, I suppose, we will be discussing Hard Boiled, John Woo's final Hong Kong film, um, starring Chow, uh, Chow Young Fat as Inspector Tequila, the greatest named inspector of all time. Tequila. Okay, we don't need to do that ever again for the See, rest that, of the year. That so. song is, of course, always inexplicably, not inexplicably, incurably, I suppose is the word I wanted, uh, tied to uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> yes, um, which, <laughs> which is unfortunately... Because it's an iconic scene. Which is unfortunately <laughs> not a part of the Criterion Collection. A major oversight. Oh, it really should be. I mean, well, yeah, definitely. Well... We'll have to do an entire episode, <coughs> you know, when we're done going through the other 600. 615 movies we have left. So um, when, we'll when do an entire episode. When we're 95 years old, to, uh, we yeah, can do that and... To movies that... Christmas Vacation. ...been admitted. <laughs> yeah, Christmas Vacation should also be in there. None of the other Vacation movies, no, really. No, it's just Christmas Vacation. vacation. Really hit their, they they, they hit, hit their stride and then completely lost it with the next one. John Woo's last Hong Kong film. Uh, he made in 1992. Uh, as Pat said, this is this is a bit of contrast to Keela here, Chow Yun Fat's character. Uh, I think this might be the first time he played uh, a well. He's always the good guy, so to speak, but he's less an anti-hero in this. Well, I guess you could argue that too. Anyway, he's a police officer instead of the normal criminal. Um, this is a movie very clearly inspired by Dirty Harry and Bullet and other such uh, over aggressive yeah, yeah. police, <laughs> police officers movies. who do not follow the law. Yes, they don't need your rules. All right, they're out to catch bad guys. They'll solve the case. I'll have your badge. And other things like that. They'll solve the case after they lose their badge, but they'll never lose their gun or their cars. <laughs> Bully and Dirty Harry are so very, very good movies. Are they not in the Criterion Dirty Collection? Harry I, I don't, Dirty I, I Harry has that. to be in the Criterion um, Collection. It might be. We'll find We'll find out later. Um, don't want to take the time to type no, that out right no. now. Uh, John Woo is actually in this movie. Um, oh, really? He plays a bartender who gives, gives the main character advice. That is John Woo, um, which is another fun fact for this. That's a little part. Um, certainly he wasn't Hitchcockian in his <laughs> cameos in his own film, um, but he takes a, a fairly active role giving, giving advice to, to his main character. Um, this movie, I'll tell you what, um, I'm umming a lot. Yeah. I didn't like this movie as much as the other John Woo movies I've seen. I didn't either. Uh, it, it, it was much more... It was much more popular, from what I've read, much more popular in America than in Hong Kong. Um, and I think it's very clear why. Uh, apparently, I have a more Hong Kong sensibility when it comes to John, John Woo movies. Uh, there's a lot less symbolism in this movie, and a lot more bloody, bloody violence. Yeah, a lot more really nonsensical violence. I mean, we might as well get it out of yeah. the way right now, but I mean, my favorite line in the whole film is... There's no room for failure now. The innocents must die. Which is by far the least sensical statement ever made by any person in film, ever. To be fair, though, we have to filter this through the fact that Pat and I could not find uh, legitimate... Uh, but... Uh, sub <laughs> subtitled copies of this, so we both have terrible dub versions but that we as watched we this know, past week. As we discussed um, off-air... I've seen this movie about four or five times, and yeah. whether dubbed or subtitled, it is always translated as "There's no room for failure now." The innocent lines die. always in there. So, and then they start trying to shoot babies. 
Yes. And yes. it's really one of the most upsetting things about this film for me, and I think probably part of the reason why you don't like it, is that the villain seems to have absolutely no reasonable motivation. Because in the other John Woo oh, films, absolutely. the main character is kind of a villain. He is an anti-hero. Um, and so you find yeah. yourself trying to understand his motivations for what he's doing. Whereas in this one, with Chow Yun-Fat playing the cop, so therefore the good guy, the bad guy just seems to be a set piece. He's just a, yeah. a talking head that tries to kill babies. It's really kind of a departure from... Yeah, it's, it's a pretty major departure it, from what John Woo is capable of doing with storytelling. It's weird to do that. Because, you know, like in The Killer, uh, Chai and fat plays, you know, a, a bad guy. He's an assassin. Uh, and therefore, the bad guy is comedically over the top in his evilness. Not, well, over the top in his evilness. Not necessarily comedically. Uh, but but he's not as far away from Chai and fat as, as they are in this right, movie. There's, right. there's a huge gulf between the moralities, or at least the the suggested moralities of uh, of our good guys and our bad guys, so that it's just it's much more disconcerting. Right, right. Like when he does something, and they're much more evil in this movie than they've ever been. Before. Yeah, and what we're really looking at here in this one is that in the other films we have comic book esque villains who are over the top, mm -hmm. whereas in this one we have villains yes. who are straight up comic book villains. They don't have reasons yes. for what they do. They just are evil because evil is... Like, I mean, it's yeah. a Captain Planet scenario, basically, in my mind. It's like, why was, do we pollute? We pollute because polluting is polluting, and it's great. Or so, you know what I mean? It's like, yes. where you wonder, why is this guy doing this? There's no motivation for him to do this, except for to be, a, you know, an adversary for the main character. So, Ugh. I was I was thinking about this, because um, we've had a lot of time between when we first watched this uh, with the intention of recording and when we're actually making this recording. Um, I was thinking a lot, and the over-topness about this, um, to, well, Dirty Harry, you know, is sort of film noir turned up to 11. Right. Um, this is Dirty Harry turned up to 11. <laughs> oh, man. There's le there's somebody there's at home like do the no math art on that at yeah. all. It's it's a bunch of it's a bunch of homage and just yeah. I mean, it's a, I, mean, I suppose there's there's a sort of art in that. There is, but and it, of course, all of the action sequences, all of the action sequences are still John Woo action sequences. They're as intricate as any ballet. Um, right, but you but, get into the question is like, what made just, John Woo films good? Was it the action sequences, or was it the the symbolism that he kind of buried under eight hundred pounds of uh, shoot 'em ups? Yeah. You know, and I think that's an important yeah. question that we get into. Is that like I honestly think that the I mean, like I really enjoyed the killer. I mean, as an example of that, yeah. his skill at hiding some pretty deep thoughts under a lot of violence, and you just don't get that with this film. You don't get a feeling that there is anything deeper beyond this is the bad guy. Bad guys deserve to die. Yeah. Exactly. And I was I was thinking about that too. Um and I I want to believe that I've just been thinking about this movie way too much. <laughs> we've had two trying weeks. to make myself like it more. Because we've had well, three weeks now since I would have first watched it. Um, and normally it's like four days. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> like for me it's usually a day. Um, yeah. Um, given that it's John Woo's last film in Hong Kong. <laughs> I like the way we say it makes it sound um, like he's dead all the time. Every time I say it, it's like <laughs> his last film in Hong Kong. Well, considering the first movie he made in America was Face Off, I think he might as well be dead. You mean a cinematic masterpiece that is Face Off? <laughs> I assume yes. that's part of the Criterion At least Collection. Face Off, Face Off went back to his general sen uh, his general uh, sense of uh, artistry. I mean, Face Off had all of the John Woo uh, symbolism tropes. It had churches, it had doves, it that's had candles. True. That's true. Uh, yeah, 
So so it, it is interesting in that he went he went back to that. But this being you know it's 1992. It's it's Hong Kong. There's a sort of sense of urgency in this movie, and maybe the sort of over the top villainry. And the urgency that we never we never really slow down in this movie is just action, 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 and we never have a chance to. There's not a lot of character development. Yeah, not even for our, our, our main two main characters. characters yeah. M- yeah, our two main characters who meet and become friends almost meet too late in the movie and start respecting respecting each other too late in the movie for that to actually play out as a friendship. Like in the killer, we have the cop and Shao Yun Fat. They become fast friends because they respect each other. We don't get to a point where they're starting to respect each other until the final hotel or not hotel hospital sequence, and it's just it's not there's not enough time. But I was thinking about the urgency and about this sort of comedic evil, uh, in respect to you know one of the reasons that John Woo is getting out of Hong Kong is the fact that it's going back to Chinese rule in 1997. Oh, okay. I hadn't thought about uh, and, that. And, you know, currently they're Hong Kong in 1992, under British rule, kind of, but more autonomous. Um, and they're still autonomous to an extent now, and they're much, but they are much more autonomous than anyone expected them to be in 1997. Yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, I remember the news discussions <laughs> of what will become of Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of worry, and it's it's kind of, you know, living what you can... <laughs> Before this apocalyptic end, I suppose, um, that is China taking back over, taking the country back over. Well, and especially if you're an artist, uh, you have maybe, to look at, like, he had to have been looking at what yeah. was going, what goes on in mainland China as relates to art and yeah. said, well, there is no freedom of art. <laughs> Do I want to be a part of that? Yeah. I got to yeah. get that. I got to get the heck out of Dodge. Yeah, absolutely. So I... I can understand his wanting to leave, and and that sense of urgency wanting to leave kind of, I feel it's maybe reflected in this movie uh, in a weird way, and I hope I'm not just overthinking it, uh, but this is this is obviously a very marked difference from anything he made before and anything he made after, so maybe, maybe there is a reason. Yeah, it. yeah, but um, then... And obviously, no, communist China has always been this sort of red herring. Ha ha! Communism was just a red herring. Um, You're fired at him. Uh, of this, you know, <laughs> I was quoting Clue. But anyway, communism, communist China is is still today this this sort of, you know, um, over the top villain uh, in a lot of a lot of Western thought. And Hong Kong is a very Western city, for as obviously Eastern as it is as well. But being under more direct British rule and certainly having more Westernization in its politics and structure and social structure uh, than anything surrounding it directly, uh, I don't know. It's just it was something interesting to think about, and then I ruminated on it for too long. Yeah, and now it's the only thing <laughs> we can think about. Can yeah, think about when we talk about this. Well, movie. okay, so let's get into some of the I guess the other elements of the film because basically what we've said so far is this is almost not a John Woo film. Like, it is, yeah. but it's yeah. not. And so, let's, I mean, I don't know. What are the other topics we can talk about? This, this podcast is only going to be 15 <laughs> minutes no. long. My dub, my dub has a lot of terrible lines, mm. um, such as uh, uh, when it's suggested that Tequila is going to have to sleep at his jazz club. Uh and that's that's the one the one bit of art is that uh, we have uh, he plays what's he play the clarinet yeah maybe I'm gonna um, go with flutophone he's, he's he's a jazz musician flutophone yes. for those of you who don't uh, know is what we played in like, fourth grade in Ohio yes the recorder or flutophone um, <laughs> it's a terrible thing um, anyway. Uh, he he's a jazz musician, nonetheless, um, which is you know a very a very Western influence as well. And I would it? say a very John Woo um, thing. It's about it's one of yeah, the few yeah. things that is very John Woo esque. That like oh, 
Our main character is yeah. a hard-nosed cop, but also a jazz aficionado. Yes. So we open on a jazz concert, and it's it's that bit of contrast from the jazz concert to the violence of the movie. It's one of the few points of art in the entire thing. And, 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 um, and that points to a universe where if he, had, we wonder if he was headed towards his normal style, and then something happened, like something made him change his mind, maybe, or maybe. you know what I mean? Because like that feels like a John Woo setup, right? Like. It doesn't yeah. feel like, when you first start the film, it doesn't feel like we're going into something that's radically different than what he's usually producing. Yeah. Oh, I wrote a terrible thing in my notes. Oh, and I'm going to have to okay. say it. So we got that opening jazz concert, and then they segue into this quiet breakfast stakeout um, as they watch an arms dealer make his arms deals. Um, and, then, and then they... They start this fight, and one of them throws tea on on one of the one of the guys. It's uh, and uh, they start this fight, and Tequila's partner's killed in the fight, uh, but along with like a ton of other people. And and what I wrote here is, I mean, I realize that this is Hong Kong, and the Chinese just grow on trees there. <laughs> but seriously, how many casualties can we just not care about? Oh, I, but I mean that's that's par <laughs> for the course with like a John Woo film, though, right? Is you have to wonder like, doesn't anybody care that there's well, a pile of bodies? It's turned up so much yeah, here, yeah. though. Like thirty people die in that first sequence, and it's in a public tea house. That's true. It's, yeah, it's not even a like at least at least at the end of the killer where a hundred people die. <laughs> it's at a secluded church, and they're all bad guys. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, here it's just like <laughs> this is just people at the tea house. Yeah. Give a guy a gun and he's Superman. Give him two and he's God. That's, that's one of the one of the first quotes after that sequence. Wow. <laughs> I missed um, that one. But he like you know he's he's sliding down the banister, shooting people, he <laughs> emptying like two clips as as the crowd of people on the stairs that he's trying to get by. It's just, it's a completely ridiculously over-the-top violent sequence. And it's very John Woo in that, obviously. But yeah, again, we have, like, the element of, like, all kinds of innocent people in the way. This is not necessarily yeah. his yeah. style, 100%. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. it does have a different, even that has a bit of a different feel to it. But It really Because, does. like, it you really know, the does. other one, you know, when um, we watch The Killer, as you pointed out, we do see a lot of mowing down, but there's a almost a deliberate representation in that film of even nobody is having these gunfights in front of huge crowds of, I guess you could call them civilians, you know. But then in this, yeah. even when they have their gunfights in public, like on that beach, in the yeah. killer, they have a gunfight on the beach, but there's no one else on the beach except that little girl. Who we take through the Yeah, hospital. exactly. That's what I mean. It's like, it's a public place, but there's then a, suddenly one... they've managed to clear all the people out. They're, they're just not there. So. Yeah. So, it's, it's, I mean, maybe that's a point of how this guy is just, that this guy is so bad, our bad guy in this movie is so bad that he'll, he'll allow this sort of thing to happen. <sighs> But it, it doesn't. Our good guys are the ones who instigate this gunfight. Right, exactly. So you get into this, like, sure, oh, okay. Sure, it escalates. Yeah, our, our bad guys... Yeah, it escalates, but still. And then and then Tequila kills our, our main baddie here, but he was a state witness, so he gets reprimanded by our very stereotypical... Uh, yeah, police sort chief. ...sort of movie. Uh, you're, off, you're off the case sort of police chief. Um, I'll have your badge. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you can't you can't solve the murder <laughs> until you've been taken right. Right, it's impossible. That's, that's how this stuff and, works. And really, even though this isn't a murder mystery, yeah. Though. And then, yeah, well, that's yeah. It's not. It doesn't. It has a lot of those weird feels to it. Like it has a lot of those tropes, but then yeah. it, there's no mystery. We know exactly who the bad guy is from moment one. Yeah, we know who the bad guy is. We know, we know 
you know, they're very baseline motivations, but we know Tequila's motivations. <laughs> well, we don't really know the bad um, guy's motivation except for evil is fun. No, we don't. He's he's evil. He's like you said, he's, he's very well, much, he's, he's very much he's a Captain Planet or yet. like a ni- Teenage Mutant he's, Ninja Turtles bad guy or something like that. He's just He's he's polluting the oceans because of <laughs> Yeah, right, right. Because of money. Yes. It's like, wait, because there's a disconnect here. Yeah. yeah, well, like, and we know he's an arms dealer, but, like, yeah. being an arms dealer doesn't clearly connect to killing babies, as far as I can tell. <laughs> I don't see where, I again, exactly. it's like, why do you kill babies? In, in what Money. What? What? <laughs> I do it for reasons. <laughs> You're pr- I, I, have, for I have reasons. my reasons. I have, like, what? twelve reasons. I could name them, but... But I here's the thing, and we get... Oh, gosh, we're, I think we've gone back into a loop into what we were talking about originally, but I get into this question... <laughs> There's really nowhere else right, to go. Yeah, I know, so. but it, I'd like... I mean, I guess we need to talk about something else, right? We can't talk about how annoying the fact that there is no plot to this film is for 50 minutes. Um, <laughs> but, like, no, like, you get into the... Uh, now I lost my train of thought, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Basically, I don't like the fact that I, I just don't like it. It, it, it. Oh, oh, I remember what I was going to say. No, oh, man, this is the worst podcast ever. Um, we get into the fact that, like, why was this movie so popular in the United States, relatively speaking, compared to his other. Like, yeah. Because I don't. Are American audiences dumb? I mean, it's a legit. I mean, well, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm uh, just trying to like, figure out, like, I mean, I am American audience, but I don't understand why. A film, the only film he made lacking character development, symbolism, and any meaningful plot development is the popular one. Is it just because the violence got cranked up to why did, 11 times 11? Why did he come to America? Why did he come to America and immediately make, you know, Face Off? It's the era of American action movies. And, you know, John Woo himself kind of kicked it off in a, in a sort of perverted way by the time it got to America. But, you know, the killer and, and John Woo's earlier Hong Kong work are clearly influences on late 80s, early 90s uh, American action food movies. You know, Die Hard. I guess that's true. Um, Culminating finally in Gunkata, yeah. as we discussed yeah. in The Killer. Um, and we we get to that. Um, it's a terrible concept. Um, but, uh... <laughs> but, but the greatest movie ever made. So, so it's kind of this, it's this cross-cultural and, and ebb and flow of influence, uh, that's kind of spiraling around the drain, really, you know, he... But yeah, that's the weird thing, is it's, it's, it's spiraling out of control into more and more just negligent filmmaking. Yeah. Like, I mean, it basically somehow converted a pretty decent filmmaker into... Yeah. At least for one movie, into... Like, basically, a combination of uh, Michael Bay and Uwe Boll. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's weird. Of the action movie world. And again, I mean, we're we're spiraling ourselves again, as you said. But yeah, well, I, let's just face the fact: this is going to be fifty minutes of us complaining about no, that plot. We're going to talk in circles about how neither of us <laughs> really really understood what's going. Understands on. why this film is popular. Um, you know, at the at the same time, you know, the next face off is. You know, for all of the terribleness of Face Off, that, that I think can principally fall, fall on the fact that it starred Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. I um, refuse to believe that that's the problem. Nicolas Cage is the greatest actor on the planet. Um, God's gift you, to acting. You can believe that if you want, Pat. Uh, it's not true, but you can believe that if you want. <laughs> Have you seen The Rock? Have I seen what? The Rock. The Rock. Um, no, but we'll watch it later. It's on the Criterion list. Is it really? No, I have seen The Rock. It, it, it really is. I'm not sure why. Nicholas Cage's Sean performance. Connery's in it? I don't know. No. Nicholas Cage's performance. Nicholas Cage's you. performance is what gets The Rock onto the... Oh, I am <laughs> sure of it, man. He really Probably. cranked his Nicholas Cage-ness up to 11 on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. Let's stop talking about Nicholas Cage. He's <laughs> anyway, not even in this film. Um... Plot wise, plot wise, uh, for all it's, you know, not making sense at all, Face Off is, you know, a, a slightly better movie <laughs> than this. 
a, a certainly yeah, more of a yeah. bop than this is. Uh, Face Off does some ridiculous things, um, and I'm not really sure on the symbolism of Face Off and the Castor and Pollux and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of heavy-handed symbolism in, in Face Off. Which but is, there is you know, swing back. Yeah, it's a swing back uh, for John Woo, though. I mean, though all of the Christian symbolism and the and the church and the everything of the killer um, that we don't get here at all in in Hard Boiled, and I feel I'm a little disappointed in us that we we were only talking about Hard Boiled uh, compared to other works of the same director, but at the same time. It's just, it's such a dip for him, in my opinion, that I think that's the only way I can talk about this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it, unfortunately, this is just the main yeah. thing. I mean, so like, I literally, I remember the first time I watched this film was specifically so I could hear that line. Because yeah. everybody I knew told me it was the greatest line in film history. And legitimately, it is one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my oh, entire yeah. life. It's, it's hilarious. It's, it's absurd. It I mean, it's hilarious. Well, it's, that's what it's makes hilarious it so hilarious. It's absurdity. Yeah. It's like it's like hearing, you know, the Captain Planet villain shout like "We must pollute the ocean" or something like that. It's yeah. It's evil without no sense. It's well, and it, yeah. it's really upsetting. I think for maybe a little bit more upsetting for modern moviegoers is film has, I think, over the last few years, taken a slightly more maybe a little bit better turn towards making sure that, I mean, you still get, like, real popcorn flicks, but you I feel like yeah. there are more There recently there have been a presence in the more mainstream media of kind of a little bit artsier films that bother to have plot and character development yeah. are breaking through yeah. to the mainstream and <laughs> so like I feel like a lot of them do it very poorly, but yeah, but at least they tried, and at least this trying. is such a <clears throat> for a modern movie goer. I feel like this is absurd. I mean, it's it, yeah. it it strikes everybody who hears it as absurd. There's nobody who watches this and says, yeah. "Well, unless you're five years old, because when you're five years old, you expect your villains to be villains because villains yeah. are villains." It's right? a very but, it's a very childish. It's a very childish explanation of, of bad guys. I mean, even the devil has motivations. <laughs> right, and but our, somehow our bad guy in this film has none. Our bad guy here is just evil for evil's sake. And not not even evil for the fun of being evil. Right, he's not that even a lunatic. Enough. He's not even a psychopath. He's. Yeah. I mean, he obviously is, but I mean, he's... That's he's, not the he's excuse. Just bad. Yeah, he's... He doesn't justify himself in any way. And... Yeah. Then it's we get really... into a serious question of why on earth would the henchmen follow these orders? <laughs> yes. Like, I well, mean, it's a serious question. Boss. Like, I mean, that's a that's another sort of G.I. Joe, Captain Planet trope that you see in this. Is like, why are these bad guys even following this main bad guy who apparently yeah. can't even figure out <laughs> who who earnestly believes profit and baby killing are connected? Yeah. Well, it's it's a weird sort of uh, stair step, though, from the end of The Killer, um, because we have... It's kind of almost a logical progression in, in the illogic of all of this. But with The Killer, you know, we've lost... There's a certain amount of lament in on the bad guy side. On the... Well, the bad guy side. Well, since... since Chow Yun Fat's character is, is strictly speaking, you know, a bad guy as far as moral standards go. Um, but we get this the sense in the killer that the organization that of the bad guys uh, has been going downhill. There's less yeah, respect. You do. There's less. There's less honor. Uh, and maybe maybe this movie is just we've hit that brick wall. Well, where yeah, and you there's kind of, so little honor that there's no reason for anything they do except to be bad. I really like this idea where we've built more of like 
like a John Woo scape rather than just a yes. <laughs> individual films. They're all connected. And it's a, the, all, his entire, entire Hong Kong film collection <laughs> is the descent <laughs> from an orderly crime organization that, that is based <laughs> in some sort of culture to just rampant evil. Mm. No, uh, let's go with that. That thing <laughs> sure. that we Why made not? up that is totally not true. <laughs> I feel like That's this is the same thing. What, 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 what film What film did we watch before that we read way too much into? Oh, I can't remember. Oh. Where we, like, I created this universe where, like, it was all connected and logical. We're dangerous, Adam. We should I, not I, have three weeks to think about a film. Listen, listen, all right? This is what literary and film criticism is about reading way too much into symbolism and making things up to fill in the gaps. Right, to make it all fit together. I, I went think to we've college done an excellent job criticism. Here. I know what I'm talking about. I really legitimately think we maybe John Woo doesn't think about it this way, but I think yeah. we have created right. the John Woo averse. All right, all right. Where, Real where quick, it's all though, connected. I want something else we can read too much into. Okay. Let's let's focus on the fact that the gun in the library murder scene, the assassination scene, the gun was hidden in the complete works of Shakespeare. Was it? I wasn't even paying attention. Yes. I think I probably zoned out during that part. <laughs> probably. So I think we let's ruminate on the fact that <laughs> the fact that Shakespeare uh, leads weapon. to death. <laughs> yes, Shakespeare. Shakespeare leads to death. Um, I don't maybe, see any major problems with that as a philosophy in general. As it works into the rest of the film, high art is bad. Which is why we avoid high art. In the movie. <laughs> like the plague. <laughs> yes, like the plague. Uh, allusions to high art. Okay, but make sure we know that it'll lead to death. Right, right. The, the, it is It is the final, it's the final straw. If you <sighs> get into high art, you're going to die. Yes, yes. Shakespeare is killer. Man reading a book quietly in the library, shot in the head by Shakespeare. There you go. It's all connected. John Woo, yeah, genius. Probably. Okay, uh, one thing I did respect about this movie uh, that we definitely need to talk about, though, um, I, obviously it's still John Woo, so there's a lot of great moments of cinematography, but there's one standout sequence here um, during... During the uh, last uh, the last fight scene, um, there is a solid three minute tracking shot. Uh, that is one fight sequence. Um, after after Tequila and uh, and the other cop meet up and they're fighting side by side through the hospital, <coughs> and they're diving oh, yeah. through windows and over counters, but the, it's solid three minutes and it's one shot. And they even, I mean, they go onto an elevator, and the elevator closes, and the elevator opens, and the shot continues back off the elevator. Um, as it's ridiculous, and it's ridiculous that obviously, you know, being a tracking shot, all of that came together in one take. I um, need to ask you a question, though. Have you ever seen yeah. Ong Bak Thai Warrior? I believe it's it is its American I title. I have not. I I uh. I assume that this this cinematography and hard boiled and John Woo likes these sort of tracking shots anyway is the inspiration. But it has a I don't know how many minute long tracking shot that's very similar, and I would say takes it to like another level where you see the main character climb a spiral building from bottom to top that's got to be like twelve story tall. I may be I may be misremembering it, but it was I remember it being a tracking shot where I was like, "Are you serious? Are we still going?" Yeah. But this one has the same it feel, is. and I mean I know that Ong Bak is derived from it, but having seen it taken yeah. again to eleven, it's like, "Wow, this is a pretty amazing shot." Well, yeah, I mean even even if if shots exist that are longer and more impressive, and certainly many many do, um, even even in a sort of action sequence idea. Uh, watching someone, you know, three solid minutes, at least, if not more, maybe even closer to five. I think there's there's one jump cut in the middle, and then we pick up the tr- same tracking shot again, um, with essentially, you know, for another minute and a half, two minutes. Um, it's jaw-droppingly 
impressive. No, it's a it's that amazing. They pulled it off, and it makes you realize that like, as far as actual directing abilities, rather than like ability to, I mean, because like you know, I mean, John Woo probably didn't write the script for this film, so the complete lack of plot development is probably not his fault. Uh, it was his maybe his fault for not making somebody rewrite it so that it actually had a plot and character development. But I mean, as far as directing ability, I mean, the man knows how to make an action film. There's no argument yeah. there. I mean, it's as far as action, the actual action cinematography goes, it's amazing. So. Yeah, I. You know, I, I thinking about it more. I I don't think it's. I think he would kind of set out to make a sort of mindless thing. Eh. You know, obvi- obviously the heavy, dirty, hairy influence. Dirty Harry is a pretty mindless movie. Um, uh, obviously, uh, at least there's a sense of mystery almost in Dirty Harry, but it's still a pretty, pretty mindless film. But just the name "Hard Boiled" suggests. Uh, it, it pulls this sort of noir stereotype. And, you know, they're dime store novels. It's the hard-boiled detective. That's true, um, yeah. I mean, I guess not... maybe... Yeah, I mean, you might be right. I mean, maybe that was him saying, like, look, this is just going to be an action film. I don't want it to be anything yeah. else. Yeah, I mean, it's pulp. It's... Uh, hard-boiled detectives are, are pure pulp. And pulp isn't... It's art in its own way, but it's art in such a lowest common denominator way. Yeah. It's not, it's not meant to be anything more than what it is. Right, and you get into the thing that about Paul being that, like, the entire concept as a whole is artistic, but the individual products of it are not really in their own right artistic. So... Yeah. And they're supposed to, you know, one... one one thing noir has that, that this kind of doesn't. Traditional noir is, is very gritty and very realistic, whereas this is very gritty but not very realistic in its grittiness. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's, that's its own... Yeah. But that's the thing is, like, yeah. I mean, I guess it, you could say that it is a John Woo interpretation of pulp. Like, yeah. Yeah. taking the element that he's good at from pulp and just cranking it to the point where yeah. It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I guess if you do not... If you kind of leave your brain at the door a little bit, as far as the story and everything is concerned, it's an enjoyable film. I mean, like I said, I've seen it multiple times. And it's fun. It's a fun movie to watch. Just because, yeah. like, I mean, the action doesn't stop. It's... And, and, but it, the action, it's weird because we talk about action films and like you get into other more recent action films, which I find hard to watch for the most part because I don't like the whole shaky cam and everything like that. But yeah, his action yeah. sequences that, are perfectly watchable that you can follow what's going on, but they're intense. They don't stop. I mean, they're, they're what I consider good action sequences. So, I mean, as, yeah. from that standpoint, it's a very watchable movie. I'm not going to say that it's not. Oh, well, it's certainly, it's certainly watchable. But it's not, it's not watchable on an intellectual level. No. Like more, a lot of his other work. Another, another thing that, you know, a lot of John Woo movies hit, that this doesn't, there's no sense of redemption. But there's no sense of a need for redemption. The right, time. the good our guy is a good guy from the beginning. Yeah, our, our main character is the good guy. Um, and even though he does things that, um, from a complete baseline standpoint, are morally questionable. Um, because he is a cop in a they, film, they, they is, are not questionable. Yeah. Yeah. This is not, this is not the way we would want our police to function in real life. <laughs> but this is a way, this is a way we want our police to function in movies. Right. In fantasy, we want police who do not stop yeah. for anything and kill want, bad guys. Yeah. Yeah, we want police who are going to get the job done no matter what. And as such, we we cheer for Tequila, even when he makes, you know, <laughs> Extremely murderous... Extremely questionable decisions, yeah. Which brings us yeah. to an interesting shooting point. Up, we are not Hong Kongians. We don't know. Perhaps this is realistic. 
Maybe, maybe. Maybe it was very realistic listeners, in 1992 please, Hong Kong. Yeah, listeners, please phone in and let us know I what really 1992 like, Hong Kong was like. <laughs> I really feel like we would know uh, if, if, <laughs> if there was a place on Earth where this sort of thing happened. <laughs> yeah, it would have been uh, like travel advisories last, or something. Within the last 20 years. Um, like, don't go to Hong Kong, you'll get shot. We, did, we were seven at the time, so... <laughs> yeah, maybe we missed it. Maybe, like, maybe, maybe the reason this movie is so we popular is because, like, all over the news in the United States is, like, first accurate documentation of Hong Kongian <laughs> daily life <laughs> from John Wu. <Liu. laughs> people being murdered for well, no reason think, in tea shops. You'd th- you think they'd be welcoming the communist rule then. Yeah, right? I mean, like, <laughs> anything to get you out of that nightmare world where you could just get shot at a yeah. tea house for no reason. Ah. Yes. Uh. Because I'm of so empty bird cages and stuff, I don't know. You know what? We're American. We're allowed to believe that. I'm. I'm going with it. I'm going. This is document, or uh, this is a doc, a documentary. Man, speaking yes. English is hard. You don't get enough practice. I. I would like to mention that my native language is actually Transylvanian. Transylvania. Uh, I don't think there is a Transylvanian. <laughs> That's what you part. think. Let's go with it. Uh, it's gonna get me off the hook. It's gonna get me off the hook for all pronunciation and grammar mistakes from now on, though. I'm sticking with it. There we go. There we go. Um, maybe I, 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 I'm thinking compared to a lot of movies I've seen recently, and I have watched a lot of movies in the last few weeks. Um, I think this sort of hard boiled, very unpretentiously displays its its movie its, its tableau well of it, violence yeah and not really trying to be artistic at all which in some yeah. ways is kind of a relief since when I mean, you consider some of the other films yeah. we've been watching recently yeah. man and and some of those are hard to watch <laughs> let me tell you i think i mentioned last time that that i i saw prometheus recently and you know, earlier uh-oh. in this, you're dating in this the podcast. We're not going to release this for six months, Adam, yeah, or okay. a year. That's okay. They're going to be like so, Prometheus. What's that? We'll talk about. Pr- <laughs> I don't think Prometheus is going to be forgotten. <laughs> we should just talk months. about it in every episode um, from now on. Yeah, we should, from now on, it's, I will compare everything. <laughs> every film will be compared to, to Prometheus, Prometheus and uh, and uh, uh, P. E. Herman's uh, Big Adventure. Big Adventure. Yeah, <laughs> like that dates it. Um, yes, we recorded all of these in 1986. <laughs> exactly. Though every movie be really confused. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, what I'm what I'm getting at is even earlier in this very conversation, uh, we we acknowledge that more movies are going for an artistic style, and even where they, even when they fail, um, it's not necessarily. At least they tried. Prometheus, I wish hadn't tried. I really wish Prometheus was just an unpretentious <laughs> alien it, action it, film. It, Alien, Alien was an unpretentious alien action. Movie. Oh, and that's one of my favorite movies. And it's it's a great movie because of it. Prometheus tries to do something and then it doesn't work. Well, and then um, I guess that brings us to the question: Is Hard Boiled a great film because it does not care that it is just action? I'm not so sure. Yeah, it's a really tough decision. Yeah, I don't think we're um, qualified to make it. But we're going to anyway, because that's because now we're critics. I even have yes. an official hat. You have the critics hat. Yes, I, I got it in the mail yet. the other day. I I need to call somebody. Yeah, it probably got lost or something. It's really annoying when that happens. Yeah. Anyway, ah, uh, <sighs> I totally derailed your whole Prometheus thing. Sorry. <laughs> No, no, it's fine because I need to not ruminate anymore on Prometheus. And I could, I could talk for another hour about Prometheus. Which is not a criterion <laughs> collection film, Adam. That is, that is not something we want to do. And that is not a movie. I pray that that movie never ends up in the criterion collection. I give it a month. Um, well, it's, it's very visually stunning. Um, but it's not. How it's long not do you think it'll be before Avatar becomes a criterion collection film? Um, I'm being totally serious about this right now. Because of I don't know. visual stunningness. The movie's I read the worst movie ever, but... They're, like, simultaneously filming three sequels to Avatar. What? Yeah. I don't know. That's apparently... That's what... 
That's what James Cameron does now. He makes Avatar movies. <laughs> oh, gosh. The avatar Oh Yeah. That's a terrifying... Which is a little disappointing because I was really looking forward to James Cameron's Prometheuses. <laughs> yeah, um, right? To hopefully make a little more sense of this of this movie. I well, Yeah, but then we get into the possibility of av- av- Avatars... Avatars? No. No, I can't accept that Avatars-es. pronunciation. No. I'm Transylvanian, remember? Um, Avatari? Avatari? Yeah, there you go. Atari? Atari, there we go. <laughs> The, the the sequel to the hit summer film Avatar, Atari. Boop boop yes. boop 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 boop. Ah, uh, as testament to how little we liked Hard Boy. We have nothing we have to say spent, about it. We're just making jokes about spent Prometheus. The majority of this, we're not even making jokes about Hard Boy. <laughs> we're making jokes about James Cameron's career, <laughs> the works of Ridley Scott, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and the name Tequila. Yeah, so I mean, is there anything else? Do you have anything else to say about Hard Boil? I have, I have, I really, I really don't. We think should I mention do. how awesome the dubbing was in our version. <laughs> if you <laughs> are going to listen to <laughs> this podcast in conjunction with watching the film, I, mean, I don't recommend that. Um, I, I don't recommend watching the Criterion version of this movie. Is that what we're getting? I into? recommend Find terrible going dub. and finding the one with the dubs because if nothing else, yeah. the female lead in that film, has the greatest voice acting ever done. So She is the most annoying woman I've ever heard. That like Go to your local brick-and-mortar video store. Uh, find one that exists. Uh, it might be in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> it might be um, close. Just break in. Find a copy. <laughs> Probably all the movies will still be there. Trust me. Um, they can't get rid of those things. At least this one will. And, uh, and go find Hard Boiled. It might be on VHS, but that's okay. You have a VHS um, player, I'm you sure. Use a VCR, you use a VCR to watch those. Um, you might have to go on a space adventure to find a, find a VCR. Or you may have to find a way to um, really, like, you know, jerry-rig a uh, Betamax or something to make it do yeah, it. Yeah. Do whatever you have to do. Thank you. Thank you for completing my Cowboy Bebop reference. Um... <laughs> I do it again. And, uh, yeah. So we get, we get into this, um, watch the movie like that, because at least you can laugh oh, at the terribleness of the The voice dubs. acting is wonderful. I love it so. Well, honestly, though, it kind of fits the notion of pulp really well. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, it's yeah. No, weird, I'll go with that. because it's, it's very, it does disconnect you from the film in a lot of ways because it is really bad. But at the same time, if you are trying to make a stereotypical, like noir pulp representation, it's perfect. That's that, that semi Bostonian accent on that secretary. Greatest thing ever. Yes. Oh, Yes. I, no, I can't and, even and, do it. Well, you know what it is. You know whose voice it is. It's uh, it's the secretary from Ghostbusters. It's almost exactly the same. <laughs> I don't remember who that actress is, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, uh, Ghostbusters. Janine. I can't even do it. I'm not even. Well, why am I going to try? I mean, Janine it? Saturday, but it's a very, very Bronxian. Oh, story. it is. It's a very East Coast American. It accent. is wonderful. Um, I that when I first it, heard that, yeah, I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. I had to stop the film. Yeah. I think at the same time, that sort of, that really high body count and disregard for the safety of the general public is very, very much a pulp thing, too. Right. So, um, it's, it's and right, fitting. Right now, the only image of that I can think of is there's a new movie coming out starring Josh Brolin and uh, um, Nick Nolte's in it about gangsters in 1930s, 40s uh, Hollywood. Uh, Sean Penn plays the head gangster, and Sean Penn's character is ridiculous. Just from the previews, he's very clearly ridiculously over the top, bad, um, in this almost Scarfacean way. Um, uh, but I think with less paranoia than Scarface. Well, I'm, Scarface maybe less. Scarface cocaine. still tried to be art. Um, yeah, the coke, cocaine's a heck of a drug. 
Um, anyway, uh, but there's one there's one scene in the previous, and the, and the movie is obviously going to be very over the top violent. But there's one scene in the previous where our bad guys, uh, in order to kill just Josh Brolin's character, at least that's the suggestion from the five second clip I get. Um, uh, he's in a movie theater, and five men with Thompsons shoot through the screen and step out from behind the screen, just blanketing the entire theater with bullets. I officially want to see this film. Um, uh, just to kill Josh Brolin's character. Uh, I cannot remember what it's called. That's a shame. Um, because we probably won't get it for another five years here in Japan, so. Yeah, I mean, you'll you'll be, you'll have... We'll have finished the Criterion know, Collection by the time it comes out. Yeah. By the time it comes out there. You'll have to move back to America to see it sometime. <laughs> right? <laughs> move back for a month. Yeah. Watch all the movies I haven't yeah. seen. Go yeah. back. It'll work. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure there's anything else I can say about Hard Boiled. Um, I don't have anything either. You know, Man, people are going to be really disappointed we, with this episode. Maybe we need well, to add we, a song and up, dance number let's to that. Look back. that let's, the, let's look back at what we've done today, John. <laughs> okay. How about you call me Pat, first of all? Fine. I looked up in your your, your like, little. Your I like how we've here, we've known each other for how many years. So I go to John years? for a second, and you call me the. Well, wrong I was getting name. really serious. Oh, I okay. thought I should. I was getting really serious. I thought I should. I was trying to be serious. Okay. All right. Okay. I was trying to be serious. All right, Mister Glass. All right. Let's look back. No, you can call me by my actual first name, uh, Beauregard. Is it really? Uh, no. Why? Because that would be that. so much better than Adam. <laughs> it would be terrible. It would be great. Uh, anyway, we would have had so um, many friends. We've uh, we've we've looked at Hard Boiled, a movie neither of us liked. <laughs> that we find. I I would the like to point out spent... that I never said that. I do not like okay, the fact that no. there is no character development. I do not like the fact that the plot is nonsensical. But I actually do like the movie. I have never been disappointed okay. when no. I watched it. I always okay. enjoy it. We'll give, we'll give that. We'll give it that. We'll give it that. Um, uh, this is a movie I will probably never watch again. There you go. Uh, however, at the same time, we've we've talked about uh, East West politics. Prometheus. Um, we've talked about James Cameron. We've talked, we've talked about, about Avatar. We've talked, we've, about... We've, we've talked about Pee Wee's well, Big Adventure. To, was... We've talked about. I was Christmas trying vacation. to say. We've, <laughs> I'm trying to get to the fact we've we've expounded on this. We've made this movie more than it is. We've actually made this um, one of the longest podcasts by, by talking about. No, no, we're still we're we're still only at forty. But we minutes. gave it more time than <laughs> Beauty and the Beast. Is it better than Beauty and the Beast? We did. Um, I would watch this again before watching that Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, I guess so. I would have my fingernails Beauty? pulled out with tweezers more before I would watch Beauty this and the Beast This movie, again, <laughs> yes. Beauty and the Beast was all substance and no payoff. At least, uh, no. Beauty and the Beast actively subverted <laughs> their own payoff. Yes. By having having the same actor play the Beast and play play the, the other guy. Whereas this one this intentionally movie just doesn't seem doesn't to have poison anything. itself. Yeah. This movie doesn't go for anything, but it doesn't poison itself, and that makes it better. Right, than right. It movies. didn't create symbolism and then defy it. Yeah. It just didn't bother to create symbolism. Yeah. Well, yeah, and again, like I said, like... Except that, If I had to know, choose between this and John, the other John Woo films that I've seen, I would choose them first. But... Yeah. If somebody says, we're going to watch Hard Boiled today... For, I don't know why. Maybe it's some sort of. Uh, yeah, we're not gonna. We're not gonna let's, argue. Let's say it's a church it. event. <laughs> <laughs> if we're watching hard okay. boil, I'm not gonna refuse. Yeah, yeah. If we're, you know, we're gonna have a potluck. Right. There's gonna be a maybe lot of a, maybe a chicken a barbecue. Casseroles. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna watch hard boil, <laughs> and then we're gonna sing "Our God Reigns" and go. Right home. there, you go. Uh, it's, it's a perfect afternoon. I, I'm actually kind of looking forward to this event. <laughs> All right. Next time we're going to talk about Walkabout. Uh, is that the next one? Which is an Australian film. Okay. Uh, huh? all right. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I didn't realize. I watched one. them all, but I don't remember the order, so. 
Yeah, Walkabout, and then and then later we'll talk about Seven Seal, and and we'll go on down the list. Walkabout, nineteen seventy one, directed by a British man, but set in Australia, filmed in Australia. Um, that movie's a trip, and I'm sure we'll have much more to talk oh, about symbolism wise. Well, we'll just have more to talk about in general with that film. <laughs> we will. So thank you for listening. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and apologize for this week's episode. I have reprimanded. Pat in the past for apologizing on our behalf. We really legitimately need to I apologize for this we, episode. We need to apologize. Don't listen this to week. this. Why did you listen to this? <laughs> it's too yeah, right. It's too like, late. Go back and retroactively make yourself not listen to this episode. We've wasted the last fifty minutes of your life. Thank you, and good night. Yeah, good night. <laughs>